First, I'd like us to um, repeat the uh, words of our mission statement for our church. And it goes something like this. Our mission is to bind together followers of Jesus Christ for the purpose of making God's will paramount in our lives. Okay? With me. Our mission is to bind together followers of Jesus Christ for the purpose of making God's will paramount in our lives. That is our mission as a church, to make sure that we gather together as a community and figure out ways to make God's will, not our will, be done, but your will be done, O oh God. And that's what we are here today to do. And every Sunday and every day of our life, that is what we are called to do. And now, for the rest of the story. It was quite a few years later. Kafka had died in 1924. He only lived 40 years. He had tuber tuberculosis and lived a suffering life, actually. I think in some ways he was a wounded healer. And his books only sold after he died. They never sold during his lifetime. And a woman who was that little girl, little Mary, saw that doll, found that doll hidden somewhere, and she looked at it again, and she noticed that there was a little pocket in the doll. And lo and behold, there was a note in the pocket. And she opened it, and it said, everything that you love will pass, but it will come together back with you at another time in a different form. Love will come back to you in a different form. Isn't that a marvelous, hopeful gift that Kafka gave that little girl and that adult woman? Everything in our life passes away, and yet, if we're paying attention, it comes back to us in a different form. That is a deep form of compassion that Kafka was showing that little girl. Henry James, another 19th century author, said there are two, three things, three things in life that are important. The first thing, is to be kind. The second thing is to be kind. The third thing is to be kind. This was Jesus' message all throughout his life. How do we show compassion to one another, to the world? How do we do this? And so that was the story the lawyer was asking the question because he wanted to be justified. Now, what does justified mean? You know, if you were writing a letter and you want it left justified, everything is in line, or right justified, everything is in line, or center justified, everything's centered in the center. It's in an alignment. Wanting to be justified with God. What does this story mean? I get. You know, the lawyer knew, loving God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. He got that. Yeah. But what does this mean, loving your neighbor as yourself? The lawyer wanted boundaries. Because we're all human here. We know what this means. How far do I have to take this love thing? How much compassion do I need to show? And of course, Jesus being Jesus, Jesus told the story, okay? Because if you just set rules, and if you just set lines, people can get around them, right? But if you tell a story that speaks to your heart, your heart knows, doesn't it? Your heart is true, if you really pay attention. 
And so Jesus told the story of the priest, the Levite, and God forbid the Samaritan. Now the Samaritan was as far as the Israelites were concerned, foreigners. Now were they actually foreigners? Not really, they were living in amongst them. But the reason why there was this vast enmity was because back during the time of the Assyrians, okay, this is about five or 600 years before the time of Jesus, many of the people were carted off in prison, but there were many Jews who remained in the land. And so when they came back from the Babylonian exile, people looked down on Samaritans. So there was a great deal of distrust and hate of these people, and I'm sure it was back and forth. So to make the hero of the story a Samaritan, <laughs> gets under your skin. If you're sitting there and you're really listening to this story clearly and closely, but then you start realizing the Samaritan was the one that showed the greatest compassion, the highest consciousness, if you will, the greatest love, the most kindness. So how then are we supposed to have that great consciousness to even people we dislike? People that we shun, the word compassion, that is the key. Compassion, with passion, with feeling. We are to feel like the other. Remember in the children's time I asked you to be the child? You were being compassionate with a child's mind and a child's heart. It's not hard to do, folks. We do it every day. The, um, the folks that went on, us, uh, on, the, on the Holy Land tour with us, many of us got the opportunity to sit down with a Palestinian family for a dinner, a meal. And there were views of what was happening there in Israel. And a lot of the injustices that were happening in that country that if they had not had this meal together and met them and seen them in person, they wouldn't know not just up here, but they now know in here. I guarantee you there will be a lot fewer Palestinian jokes in the household because they know them. They were and are able to be compassionate so that is what we are called to do. If we are going to bind together followers of Jesus Christ for the purpose of making God's will paramount in our life, what is God's will? Jesus showed us the way. Compassion to even people we don't like. Learning to feel what they feel. We are the person in the ditch too. We are the person in the desert too. We are the person starving. But in order to be saved, sometimes it takes people to cross the boundaries. Remember, the lawyer was asking what the boundaries of compassion were. We have to ask that same question of ourselves and of God. What are the boundaries? How do we discover those? And Jesus was saying, there are no boundaries. You are to love. That is what God's will is. Back in 1967, we were in the heat of the Vietnam War, and there was a sortie coming from a, an aircraft carrier and Navy pilots, Skyhawks, and they were up near <laughs> Hanoi. And one of the pilots got shot down, and um, he was in, had his parachute going, but uh, his arms were broken, and uh, he was in a very bad way, and he landed in a small lake. And 
They had been bombing a, a light bulb factory, and it just so happens a colonel in the Viet Cong forces was there in the light bulb factory and came out and saw this parachute fluttering down, and the pilot was struggling as the pilot was going down. And so he ran out, and he got a bamboo pole, and he helped wedge this pilot up out of the bottom of the lake, this mucky lake and was able to bring him over to the side. But as soon as he did, of course, a lot of people followed the parachutes and they were beating him and they were tearing off his clothes and they were trying to kill him. And the colonel put his body over this pilot and he saved his life. Well, for the next five and a half years, he was in Hanoi Hilton, which was the prison there in Hanoi for pilots especially. And that man's name was John McCain. John McCain traveled back to Vietnam and he met the man who had saved his life and he asked him why. And the man said, what was his name? I've got his name. Um, Mai Van On. Mai Van On. And Mai Van On said, I saw you in the lake, and I saw that you were just another human being. Compassion. I saw that you were just another human being. Now, we are facing some of our own problems with neighbors, aren't we? Diane Haynes is a leader in the Minnesota Conference of the United Church of Christ, and last year she took a group to the Mexican-U.S. border to see some of what was going on on the Mexican-U.S. border. And I emailed her, I asked, do you have another trip planned? And she said she's looking at late October, early November. I think it might be something we could consider as a group to go down there to the border and witness. I'm not saying that you're going to do something yet. I'm saying witnessing, seeing them as human beings so that we open up our hearts for compassion. That's all we're saying. Give love a chance. May it be so. Amen.